So let's start today by talking about what this vaccine really is, um, what how it's different from other vaccines, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how FDA trials work and what they're seeking to do and what it really means to say that something is safe and efficacious. And then we'll talk about sort of what the difference is between bad reactions or adverse effects and side effects. And then we'll talk a little bit about why vaccine will actually protect you, why it's important for you and for your patients and, and your clients and for your family and for the people that are around you. I'm going to try and dispel some of the myths that you may have been afraid to ask about, but that um, that are definitely on the, in the back of your minds, I know, because they're in the back of everybody's minds. And then I'm going to start getting right into the questions. So feel free to send more questions through the chat. And I think, um, I'm not sure exactly how we'll uh, organize that to make it so that I I can see everything I need to see, but we're going to figure it out. Um, so definitely, oh, I think you have a Q&A too. So throw them into the Q&A and I'll do my best to get to everything. But I want it to feel like a back and forth instead of just me chatting. Although, honestly, it turns out I've learned from this pandemic and we've all learned things about ourselves. I've learned that I can talk for an hour and a half. Just keep talking. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's good or bad. So let's talk first of all about the vaccine. So let's think about vaccine in this sort of historical context, right? So the first vaccine was Edward Jenner um, noticed that people who worked as milkmaids and they milked cows didn't get smallpox. They did, however, get an infection from milking cows all the time called cowpox or vaccinia. And because of that, they were able to avoid the smallpox infection. And he theorized that if he maybe gave regular people who weren't milkmaids a little bit of that cowpox and gave them a little cowpox infection, maybe they would be able to avoid getting smallpox as well. And so he literally took some of the cowpox from the women when they had cowpox on their hands and put it onto the skin of other people that didn't have, hadn't had cowpox before, that didn't work with cattle. And then they were, they did get cowpox, but they were then immune from smallpox, which was much more deadly and much more disfiguring. And that was the very beginning. That's why we call it vaccination, because it was vaccinia that started it all. Now, that is sort of the old version. That's a live, basically a live attenuated virus. Now, nowadays we take the actual virus or, or bacteria or whatever we're looking for if we're going to make a live vaccine and we make it weaker. Attenuated means weaker so that it doesn't cause a serious infection in people. And then we give people a small amount of that. That is um, the original homeopathy, right? <laughs> Um, but that did not, that works very, very well, but certain people can't get that kind of vaccine. If you have a depressed immune system, I have rheumatoid arthritis and take medicines for that, that make it impossible for me to get live vaccines. And many other people can't get them as well. And they do have a tendency to spread, but they work really, really well. Now, because some people couldn't get them, we created a new way of making vaccines. I'm going to simplify the next big chunk of vaccine development into one category and call this vaccine 2.0. Basically, it's the idea of using inactivated viruses or inactivated bacteria. So you grow the virus, you grow the bacteria, and then you somehow keep it from being able you you know, you kill it in some way that doesn't destroy the virus or destroy the bacteria, but makes it so that it can't replicate anymore. And then you give that to people and they can recognize it as not a good thing. Their immune system recognizes it and then makes an immune response. So that the next time when they see a live version, it is um, definitely then able to get rid of it before it causes much of a problem. That's really the whole category of vaccine 2.0. There's a lot of other things where they take proteins and they conjugate them, but the bottom line is that all of them require you to grow the virus or bacteria in a sterile type way. And I know that doesn't make sense to say it's sterile, but sort of not contaminated way, and then um, use that to create these vaccines in order to help other people um, develop immunity. And that's what takes so long. So all the vaccines that have been developed up until very recently have been these kinds of vaccines that are really based on growing a virus or a bacteria and then in some way modifying it or adding other proteins to it or doing things to it. That takes forever to develop because to be honest with you, 
Growing bacteria and viruses in culture is hard. There's frequently contamination. It takes a long time to manufacture those kinds of vaccines, that sort of thing. And that's why four years for the mumps vaccine was the fastest we ever had. Since we last started making really powerful vaccines um, for things that were really common in the world, we've come out with brand new molecular techniques that have been used in a lot of other things. So this idea of creating messenger RNA and giving it to people is actually already used in some cancer therapies and in some other things. And so the, in, in some other treatments, maybe neurologic and things like that. And so it's been tried, it's also been tried in vaccines that were less successful, which made people like me think, well, maybe it's not gonna work very well for this vaccine either. But this is a completely different technique. It is vaccines 3.0. It can be done extremely quickly. So instead of having years of time to figure out how to grow a virus or bacteria properly and then how to inactivate it in a way that's safe, instead of having all of that run up time, you just program in whatever protein you need to sort of using a, the recipe of the RNA that code or the DNA and then RNA that codes for the protein that you want to make antibodies to. And you just plug it into this sort of system that we have of creating synthetic RNA and then which is actually the same as regular RNA. It's just made differently. And then you have to figure out a way to keep it stable inside the human body long enough to get into your cells. That's it. So the way these vaccines work is that messenger RNA recipe for the spike protein. That's the best, that's that little piece that makes the crown on the coronavirus, the thing that sticks out and looks like a little umbrella or a little spike on there. That spike protein is what most of our antibodies are to when we and when we recover from infection. We, we are really focused on getting inactivating that spike protein because that spike protein is what attaches to our cells and allows the virus to get in. So they take the recipe, the RNA recipe for that, and they create it. And then they inject it into us with some stabilizers. And the, that RNA is degraded actually in less than an hour after the dose is given. And, but in that hour, it does a lot of good. Your cells are programmed to translate or transcribe in this case, um, RNA into proteins. So they take any recipe they get. Usually all the recipes are coming from the nucleus of the cell and they're going to these little ribosomes where they, they are taking the RNA and they are turning it into a protein. They read the recipe, they throw everything in in the right order, and then you end up with a protein. It takes this same messenger RNA that you've just gotten as your vaccine, and it just reads it just like it's anything else coming from the cell itself, and it makes you a spike protein. And that spike protein does what all spike proteins do, it just goes and floats to the outside of the membrane of the cell, and there it sits. Now, the body knows that this is not a normal protein, and your immune system recognizes it immediately as an invader. But it's just on one of your regular cells in your arm, just a regular cell and it presents that antigen that that spike protein to other cells that then activate the immune system in short if it was a cartoon you might think of it as placing a giant wanted poster for coronavirus on the outside of your cell and advertising to the immune system that this this is what's coming you need to know this and recognize it right away your immune system gets to work and it starts creating not just antibodies, but also T cell immunity and other things that are harder to get from other types of, of uh, vaccines. And then you get a second dose and that second dose is a whole lot like a training exercise. So, you know, sometimes you learn how to do something like how to use a new software system and then you do your first project with that software system or you use it for the first day. And you know how it's like a little bit rough, but by the end of that project, you understand how to use that software system way better than you did after just the, the first little training episode. That's what a booster of this vaccine does. It takes a small immune response that you get right after the first vaccine and it says, okay guys, I'm showing you the picture again, go at it. And it says, your immune system just wakes up and says, I got it, I know what to do. We saw this picture before, we need to react to it. It's like a fire drill for your body. And a bunch more proteins, like immune proteins are made, a bunch more antibodies and a bunch more cytokines and your body actually has a trial run at killing off COVID. That's what gets you to that peak immunity of 95% that they're showing in the trial. And that's why two doses really are very important. It's not just 
sort of random who's going to be immune after which dose. The point is that your immunity is durable and better and stronger, and your immune system is more ready after that second dose. So now you understand what messenger RNA vaccines are, why they can be made much more quickly, and why we need to have two doses. But that brings me to, are they really safe and are they really as good as everybody says they are? Well, in the United States, we rely on the FDA to make that decision for us. The FDA is a government body that is similar to the NIH. It's not exactly sort of run by the government. It's run by scientists. I have friends that work at the FDA, and they're upstanding good people and honest and reliable. And what they do is they set standards. They say the most important thing, we're not going to approve any drug for use in the United States, and we have the toughest standards here of any country in the world, unless it is both safe and it works and does what you said it was going to do. And they set all these rules for companies and people making new drugs or new vaccines. And they say, here's what you have to do at least this much to prove to us that yours is safe and that it works. And our standards are higher than anywhere else in the world. Now, we did cut some corners for this vaccine, but they didn't cut corners on the safety. They cut corners, honestly, on the efficacy. And they cut corners on all of the extra data that we would usually collect in terms of vaccines and that sort of thing. They wanted to make it as easy as possible. They also fast-tracked everything. So instead of waiting in a line with all of the other drugs and vaccine candidates, everything having to do with COVID went straight to the front of the line. And that's really important because everyone wants to know, how did this get through the approval process so quickly if nobody cheated? And the reality is that nobody cheated, but they did get advantages. They got a lot of red tape removed and they didn't watch to see how long the immunity would last. That's the most important one. So what they did is they told all of the trials that all of the different vaccines that they needed to watch for two months. Why two months? Well, because in all of the vaccine trials that have happened in the past, only about three to seven vaccine adverse events have ever happened that have been linked to the vaccine after eight weeks. And all of those were in live vaccines. So those live attenuated vaccines 1.0 in people who are immunocompromised, and they ended up with infection later on. So what we know is that all of the bad things that can happen to you that have ever happened to people and been reported to the FDA happened in those first eight weeks. And so they said, actually they happened in the first six, but they decided to go to eight just to be extra careful. So they said, this is how long we need you to watch for safety. Efficacy, if you can prove that you're good at eight weeks, that's fine. You just go as long as you have to go to prove that it makes people immune, and then we'll start giving it to people. We know it might wear off sooner. We know we won't have a good idea of if it lasts six months or nine months or a year or two years or 12 years. We're not going to know that because we're not going to, no one wants to sit around and wait for that. If it works even for a short time in the middle of this pandemic, we need to get it out there. But we have to make sure it's safe. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking to yourselves, what about those long-term bad effects, like people who have Guillain-Barre syndrome after a vaccine or who had some sort of neurologic problem? Those can last a lot longer than eight weeks, and that's true, but they all started within the first six weeks. And so what we need to do is follow people for at least two months to make sure that they're doing okay and not having any of these serious adverse effects. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about having an arm, sore arm after the vaccine or anything that the vaccine is intended to do, like it create immunity. And um, we're talking about adverse effects that the vaccine is not intended to create. There were none in the trial for, for the mRNA vaccines. In either the Moderna trial or in the Pfizer trial, there were none. There were more people who died in the placebo group than died in the vaccine group. And even in terms of things like heart attacks or things that did, nobody thought would be related to the vaccine, but you have to watch out for anyway, there just weren't any problems. A couple of people did develop um, Bell's palsy, which I don't think I would call a serious adverse effect because they all resolved and there were actually more cases in the placebo group than there were in the trial group. But those sort of neurologic things are things we're always looking out for. You did hear about a couple of trials being held um, for short periods of time because of things called transverse myelitis, but those are different than these drugs. And we don't know exactly what happened with those because that's part of the AstraZeneca, which we haven't approved yet in the United States. They were not part of the Moderna and Pfizer trials, which are the two mRNA vaccines that are currently approved. So it's important to know that we feel really confident 
that these vaccines did not cause any problems. Now, the next question you should ask is, but how many people did you try it in? We tried it in 40,000 people each vaccine. A lot of people got this vaccine before we asked anybody from the general public to get it. And we followed those people, not me personally, but the people running the trials followed those people and they're still following them because we still need an answer as to how long it lasts. We just don't know that yet. And we didn't need that in order to make them available to people because it's so much more important that we actually end up immune. So there's a big difference between serious adverse effects of which there were none associated in the trials and then side effects. And a lot of you have been hearing probably from your other healthcare worker friends uh, or on Twitter or on the news about people feeling pretty nasty after they got their second dose of the vaccine. Some people feel sick after their first dose as well, but the vast majority feel yucky after their second dose. The truth is that it's about 20 to 50% of people have significant symptoms after their second dose. But those symptoms are not a bad reaction to the vaccine. Those symptoms are the actual effects of your immune system being pushed to do a training exercise. Imagine it's like if you training for a marathon, you're going to get sore muscles. Same thing. If you're training your immune system to fight off something as nasty as COVID, you're going to get some soreness in your arm, maybe some fatigue. A lot of people have a little bit of chills but that everybody is better within 36 to 48 hours after the dose. And most of those symptoms don't even start until 12 to 24 hours after the dose is given. So we're talking about 12 to 24 hours of not feeling your best as an investment in training your immune system to fight off COVID, a disease that's killed so many Americans. It's almost as many now as we lost in the second world war. We're losing so many Americans every day that it's like having 9-11 happen every single day. And not all of them are older Americans. Many of them are younger people who didn't expect to have a bad time with this virus. Of course, the vast majority of them are older people with, with other comorbidities, but that doesn't mean that you're safe or protected. And I know many of you have seen this firsthand these days. And you've experienced it in your families, or you've seen it in your patients or in your coworkers. It's not pretty, but this vaccine and putting up with a little bit of side effect, which is literally the same as having sore muscles after a workout, just it's immune system soreness, is worth it. I think it is, a lot of people think it is, but you have to keep that in perspective. And you have to be careful that you don't worry too much that this is some sort of bad reaction to the vaccine. It's not, it's actually intended. It's the point of the vaccine. And it's probably why the vaccine works so well. Now, a good half of the people getting this vaccine aren't gonna have any symptoms and they're gonna be just fine. And it turns out that they have just as good of an immune response as the people who do have symptoms after their vaccine. So you don't need to worry if you're one of those people whose arm isn't very sore or who doesn't get a headache. But the truth is that if you are one of those people who gets that, you can think of it as the tingle means it's working. I was actually very disappointed that my arm wasn't more sore after the first dose. And I know this is creepy and weird, but I'm a little bit looking forward to having a good immune response this weekend after I get my second dose. I'm really hoping, maybe because my immune system isn't quite up to snuff, I'm really hoping it, it shows me it can mount a good immune response by making me feel at least a little bit like I did something important. I don't know. I'm probably a little bit nuts when it comes to that. I understand if you're not that excited about it. So what's the point of getting this? You know, you've been around COVID for a long time. Many of you haven't gotten COVID. Some of you are already immune to COVID because you had COVID. Well, the truth is that if you had COVID, your immunity wanes over time. And it's not very easily predictable how well that immunity wanes or when it's going to wane for each person. We don't know who is going to do better and who's not going to do better, but we know that your time clock is going to run out at some point. And so it's a strong recommendation that you could, that you get vaccinated. There's almost no other disease for which the vaccine actually creates better immunity than just getting the disease. But this is one where the vaccine actually appears to do even better. So I recommend that you go out and get the vaccine, but wait 90 days after your infection with COVID so that you are not using a dose during the time when we know you're immune and so that you're not, uh, you will have worse side effects the sooner you get it after your COVID. You could go a little longer than 90 days if you wanted to, but 90 days is sort of what I would recommend. Those of you who haven't had COVID, you've been lucky. You've done everything right. 
And I know that we're not going to let you stop doing things because these, these vaccines aren't perfect and they aren't going to make every, you know, they probably aren't going to perform 95% in reality as they did in the trials. And people with like less functional immune systems like mine aren't going to see 20, 95% efficacy from the vaccines. So things like masks and layering these interventions, like I've told you before, masks, distance, ventilation, eye protection, washing hands, all of those things are different layers that are not perfect, but knit together, they work really well. Vaccine is another really important layer. It helps protect you when everything else is failing. And it also, as more and more people get vaccinated, it creates something called herd immunity. It means that more and more people are unable to get the, vac to, to get the virus which means that the people that you're coming into contact with are less likely to have the virus because there's less likely to be spread of the virus because fewer people are susceptible to the virus. Just think about if you um, imagine everybody in a room is either susceptible to the virus, currently infected with the virus and transmitting it to other people, and then immune to the virus. If the vast majority of the people in the room are immune to the virus, then you don't have nearly as many people in the category of either susceptible or infected. That's why it's so important to get people immune. Now, a lot of people have been talking about using herd immunity, herd immunity, but just letting everybody get sick. The problem is that some of the people in that room, if they get COVID, will die. And if you let everyone who is, you know, you can try and protect the people you think are highest risk, but we just don't know who's the highest risk. And a lot of people, are going to have to get COVID. And that means you're gonna to have to go through a period of time where a lot of people in the room are actually infectious. And it's really, really hard to protect people without taking them out of the room somehow. And I don't know how you're gonna do that when this is when the room is actually our community, our family, our lives, right? You can't take someone out of your family for a year because you know they might be high risk and store them away somewhere else around everyone else. So the important thing to remember here is that Using a vaccine allows us to skip over that infectious period. Now, there is a little complication to this in that one of the corners that was cut definitely in the vaccine uh, in this is that they, they didn't actually look to see, make sure that people weren't getting asymptomatic COVID. Now, we all believe that the, it's highly likely that people aren't going to be able to get asymptomatic COVID once they've gotten this vaccine, but it is possible. And we don't know, especially over time, getting further away from your dose. And so it is really important that, especially when you're around other people who are unvaccinated, that you continue to wear a mask and protect other people. Because if you had subclinical COVID, you could pass it on to someone else. But we'll know more about that in the future. So this isn't something that we're saying forever and ever and ever. Oh, I got, apparently I dropped and I came back. All right, good. I apologize if you missed something important. Moving on, um, last bit before I get into questions, and I see some people are asking them, and I apologize if my internet is unstable. Uh, myths, infertility. There's no connection between this vaccine and infertility. It just wasn't tested very well in pregnant women because it's actually general practice not to, protect, not to uh, do a lot of trials in pregnant women or in young children until the DART studies are done. And DART studies are looking at animal toxicity in, in neonates. And the DART studies have been done, and now it appears as though it's very safe. Um, those final results should come out at the end of this month. But the interim analysis is that there's no toxicity from this vaccine. The fact that it degrades in your arm in less than an hour really points out that the center of this immune response and everything that's happening is right here. They aren't finding it in placentas or in the tissue of the newborns in these DART trials, the animal toxicity trials, and that's very good sign. But they just didn't test it in them, and so there isn't as much data saying it's it's safe. Now, they also didn't test it in people like me who are immunocompromised, but that isn't stopping me from getting the vaccine because there's nothing different about me. I'm just less likely to respond to the vaccine than the people who have normal immune systems. In pregnancy, I know there are a lot of questions about this, and I think it's somewhat an individual decision. We did a town hall at the University of Chicago, and I met with a lot of our, um, our maternal fetal medicine specialists and our neonatologists, pediatricians and our other obstetrician gynecologists. And they all said to a T, especially for people working in healthcare settings or the kind of settings where you all are, 
the risk of COVID is much greater to your baby and to you than the risk of the vaccine. The risk of the vaccine is all theoretical. There's not actually anything been shown or proven at all. And it certainly doesn't cause infertility in the long run. There's literally no targets in those cells that could possibly even be affected by this vaccine. So I don't think you need to worry about that, but I do think if you're pregnant and you're thinking about getting vaccinated, you should talk to your obstetrician about what the risk is to you and what the benefit is because everybody's in a different situation and there isn't as much data. But we are encouraging our pregnant people to get vaccinated at the University of Chicago and a lot of them have done so and been just fine. And COVID itself does cause preterm labor and we don't know if it has long-term effects on a fetus. Does this get into your DNA? No. This is messenger RNA, and there's no back step to go from messenger RNA to DNA. And so this, unlike, well, some people have talked about other DNA vaccines that have been tried in the past, which are effective, but could actually change your own DNA. This can't. There's no way our body doesn't have any system for going backwards from messenger RNA into DNA. There are reverse transcriptases that are part of viruses like HIV, but those don't work on messenger RNA. So you just need to trust me and trust science because there's no way that can happen. There are no microchips in the vaccines. They're, in fact, they come in these vials with five doses in them. How would you know that you were giving which person which microchip? You can just know from that standpoint, it's impossible that there are microchips in the vaccines. Plus, there's no microchip that's small enough to fit five of them into one of these tiny vials. Um, the other issue is, I think, largely with the rush testing. Yes, corners were cut, but those corners were bureaucratic, red tape, and largely about the duration of immunity and some add-on data, like they didn't test everybody with weekly or every other day nasal swabs to make sure nobody was carrying COVID around asymptomatically. Um, and you can't really tell because the only way to know somebody has been infected is to go ahead and check their antibodies, which are positive because they got the vaccine. So that's why you hear people say that you might be able to carry COVID even after you've gotten the vaccine. It's just that it's not that there's evidence that you can, it's that there's no evidence that you can't. And those are two totally different things. It's like saying that uh, the scarf in this box is not purple. That doesn't mean it's red. It just means it's not purple. And in this case, we don't know the color of the scarf in the box or the COVID in the people. So we just can't tell. Okay. I've gone through a lot of things here. I'm going to try and address uh, the couple of questions that are here in the Q and A, and then I'm going to get back to these list of submitted questions. Right. Um, so I don't have any good answers. There's some questions about the delay of delivery to different facilities. This is really tricky right now. The Delivery, I, I can't figure out what's going on with delivery. One of the biggest issues in my mind with this vaccination um, rollout is that no one knows what they're getting and when they're getting it. The federal government hasn't been very forthcoming, and so you can't rely on shipments. And then there's this storage issue and logistics that make everything a lot harder. But I think that you're going to get a vaccine soon. And I'm sorry that you haven't gotten it yet, but I think that's a better question for someone else, not for me. Um, so allergies. A lot of people have questions about allergies. And again, I'm going to refer to myself and to my expert allergist. I am allergic to a million things. My immune system's a bit overactive, if you didn't notice. I have had anaphylaxis five times in my life, and one of them was to a medication, to a penicillin based medication. And I've had anaphylaxis to my allergy shots before. So I know a lot about being anaphylactic. I carry my EpiPens around with me, and I had a heart to heart with my expert allergist and who once told me I was the most allergic person she'd ever met, not something that you really want to be called. Anyway, she said, no worries, Emily, you should get this vaccine. She deals with patients along with every other allergist in the world, deals with people who've had allergic reactions to vaccines in the past, and says we routinely give people vaccines to which they have been called allergic before in the clinic under controlled circumstances where we're able to rescue them if they have any reactions. So if you know that you've had a bad reaction to vaccines in the past or to any of the components of this vaccine, most specifically polyethylene glycol, and now they're also saying polysorbate, which is actually just very similar to polyethylene glycol. Now, those are two really long chemistry sounding words, but polyethylene glycol is what's in Miralax or in the prep for a colonoscopy. That's what you would know it as. 
So if you've had a problem with those in the past, then you want to talk to your doctor and you want an allergist to help work with you to get the vaccine taken care of. You don't want to just go sign up and have the vaccine somewhere else. And you may want to or have to wait for one of the other kinds of vaccines that are not messenger RNA. There's some adenovirus factor vaccines and some inactivated vaccines coming in the pipeline. And so sit tight, there will be something for you. But not being able to take a flu shot is not a reason to not take this. Um, these vaccines are completely different than all the other vaccines that we've had. And there is, um, most of us are really pushing back on this idea that you shouldn't get this vaccine if you've had a bad reaction to a vaccine. We're vaccinating people like me who've had anaphylaxis to all kinds of medications and people who've had bad reactions to other vaccines before. Happy to vaccinate them here. You just want to make sure you do it in a setting where they're able to monitor you and make sure that you don't have a bad reaction. I did great with this. I didn't have anything. Um, uh, are you required to take time off after the second dose? I don't know. It depends on what the rules are at your facility. Now, at the University of Chicago, we acknowledge that people are going to have side effects after the second dose. We've encouraged people to take Tylenol or ibuprofen ahead of their second dose in order to head off some of those symptoms. We don't want people to be miserable. And we've also asked people to, if they feel well enough to work, and as long as they're not currently febrile, they can come to work. So even if you had a fever in the middle of the night, if you took some Tylenol and it went away, you're welcome to come and work as long as it's within the next 48 hours after you got that vaccine. If it's beyond that, then we're asking you to stay home and reach us in occupational medicine. We'll make a decision about whether or not you need to be tested for COVID. We certainly have had a fair number of people develop COVID right after their first dose. Not a lot, a handful, right? The same number as would, we have thousands of employees and we do about a thousand vaccines a day, a little under that. So we have a lot of people get COVID every day just from community exposures. And so it was no, not higher than that. Nobody's getting, you can't get COVID from this vaccine, it's impossible. But um, they probably had an exposure the day or two before they got the vaccine and then they got sick right afterwards. If you know you've had an exposure, you shouldn't get the vaccine until you're sure that you don't have COVID. Because if you have COVID, you don't need the vaccine right now and that dose can go to someone else. Okay, I'm gonna, um, uh, yes, I think I, I, the question, there's a question in the chat about if you have to wait 90 days, will the vaccine still be available? I'm assuming the answer to that is yes. Certainly we expect everything to be easier a week from now and certainly 90 days from now, it should be even easier to get vaccine and vaccines are gonna continue to be free. I suspect the answer to that is yes, but I don't know the actual specifics of it. Um, so a lot, a, a report of a healthy physician in Florida who passed away after receiving the second dose because he had a stroke. People have strokes every day. One person in this country having had a stroke within 24 hours of having had their dose when millions of people have gotten doses does not constitute a bad reaction to the vaccine. In the trials about, in the Pfizer trial anyway, about five people had heart attacks that were fatal after receiving a dose of the vaccine within a week of the vaccine dose. Most of them were in the, uh, in the group that had received the placebo. So we can't just say because one thing happened one time to one person that that's an issue. I'm not worried about that. Given the, the, uh, the incidence of stroke in the general community, I'm surprised more people haven't had stroke sim uh, shortly after their vaccine, just as an, uh, uh, coincidence. Um, if you get the vaccine within the 90 day window of having had COVID, with this, which the CDC says you can choose to do, but individual organizations may not allow you to do because they want to hold on to their vaccine supplies for people who are not immune, you will have, at least from what we've seen both in the trials and in our experience on the ground, you will have a lot more symptoms. Uh, a friend of mine who had COVID in March and had the vaccine after her first dose, she felt kind of the way people feel after their second dose because her immune system already was primed. And so she was really putting her immune system through uh, another trial run with even the first dose. There's still good evidence that we should give them two doses, but I don't know whether or not that's gonna hold on for true based on what we've seen. People who had COVID before have a pretty, have that sort of my immune system knows what they're doing kind of reactions after their first dose. But if you're willing to do it, you're willing to do it. Um, that's the, I've gotten another question about the Miami doctor. Uh, anaphylactic reaction to food. I'm allergic to apples, peaches. I have anaphylaxis to both of them. Um, and I, I have no problem. There's no connection between food 
and this vaccine. And none of the people that have had anaphylaxis to this vaccine um, have had any issue. One person in the United Kingdom who had an anaphylactoid reaction, which I don't know what that even means, but it wasn't technically anaphylaxis, did not, had an allergy to peanuts. I don't know what to tell you, but I'm not really very worried about it. Um, we're allowing people with anaphylaxis to food to get vaccinated, and we've only had one person to have anaphylaxis, and that person had no serious history of anaphylaxis before. They had a pretty significant reaction and had to be admitted to the hospital overnight, but they did fine. Um, list, okay, now I'm gonna look at these submitted questions. Um, I'm gonna get to this one about, well, I'll just address it now. Will this vaccine work on the new strain of COVID? Let's talk about that new strain of COVID for a minute. So the new strain of COVID is actually has about six different mutations that are known to be more transmissible on their own. So in other populations where they've seen sort of um, super spreader events or aggressive outbreaks where the attack rate is really high, they've looked at those viruses and sequenced them and found some, out, uh, some mutations that are associated with those things. And this new virus has six of them. That's nasty. Now, a couple of them actually make it bind to your receptors. We, they've been checked in vitro and in, you know, sort of in, in labs, and they find that some of them, some of these new mutations make it bind better to your cells, to the ACE2 receptors on your lung cells, so you don't need as much virus to make you sick. Some of them make it work faster and replicate faster so that you can be contagious earlier. It's nasty. Now, the good news is that none of them are associated with more severe disease. And none of them, and the good news also, this is new, hot off the presses in the last 24 to 48 hours. Um, in the United Kingdom, they're saying there's no increased incidence in children above and beyond just the fact that it's making more people sick. It's making more children sick, but it doesn't appear to be worse in children or targeting children, which people have been concerned about because it was better able to target the um, ACE2 receptor. Now, the other thing is that it may evade the immune system. So some one of the immune, one of the mutations in the new variant is one that had been seen in people who um, got recurrent COVID, which made people concerned that perhaps antibodies wouldn't work to it. Um, the good news is that this only affects a very protected part of the spike protein. And I, I actually, I did a talk with this wonderful uh, uh, biologist, you know, immunobiologist, vaccine biologist, who had a great picture, 3D picture, but I, I don't have access to it. It shows how it's sort of buried in there. And the good news is that the majority of the vaccine antibodies actually attack other parts of the virus, of the spike protein. And so there's every expectation that you're going to make a lot of different antibodies, not just ones only to that part that's different. That one may be not as good, but your body seems to make lots and lots of different antibodies to different parts of the spike protein using these messenger RNA vaccines. And so there's an expectation that the vaccine will still be effective. I've heard some people say on an individual, some experts have suggested on an individual level that it may reduce the efficacy of the vaccine from 95% to maybe 85%, but I gotta tell you, I will take 85% over zero. So even if that's the case, which has not been proven, it's good. It may have an effect on how many people we need to immunize in order to get to that herd immunity where there's so few people left to infect that it just doesn't spread very well, um, but we don't actually know that number exactly. And I think that's in some of your questions that you've submitted all, all as well. The number of people that we need to vaccinate is, uh, the number of people who need to be immune is probably between 60% and 80%. And that number is based, usually calculated based on the transmissibility of the virus. But if this new variant is more transmissible, then we would expect that that number would be higher. Then, oh. Okay. And then also, I think there's an issue with um, if the vaccine isn't as good, then it won't work quite as well. Can you guys hear me or is am I uh, disconnecting again? Dr. Landon, we can hear you. You get OK, good. I was like, I have this yeah, connect. That's fine. Great, thank you. So um, I think that we may need to have the number of people vaccinated. If the vaccine's only 95% effective, which is really, really effective, you have to vaccinate 5% more than whatever your target number is because some of them won't really be immune. So if it's only 85% effective, then we have to vaccinate even more people. So there's a lot of vaccine. 
Okay, these are questions. Long-term side effects associated with the vaccine. No, there are none. There were none that were found. And long-term side effects, remember, those are side effects that last a long time. But in the past, and with all other vaccines, it's always happened within the first two months after the vaccine has been given. And this messenger RNA technology is used in other cancer therapies, and we're not seeing anything because of the technology. What are the general side effects of the vaccine? I think we went over this. Sore arm, headache chills, sometimes people have a fever, that's all. Severe anaphylactic reactions, some people do have them, that's not uncommon. If we gave millions of people penicillin, we'd have a lot of people having anaphylactic reactions and no one would hesitate to take penicillin if their doctor recommended it to them. So I think that you should look at this um, anaphylaxis in sort of, you have to look at it in the context of, of what's actually happening. Exposed after having the vaccine, a vaccine, is there still a need to quarantine and separate? And the answer to that question is we don't know. Um, we think that probably that's one of the first things that we can do, sort of cut back on. In fact, at the hospital, we're going to allow people that to sort of we're dropping them down two levels of risk after an exposure so that they don't necessarily have to quarantine. But that's two weeks after the second dose of vaccine. And we're going to test them still and make sure that we're doing OK. Um, that's the number one thing that we're going to work on uh, getting a better answer for. But I think over time, that's going to happen for everybody. But in the meantime, you're going to have to stick with the rules as they stand. Um, the other question is, what is the waiting period between the two vaccine doses? The Pfizer vaccine is three weeks between doses or 17 days is the minimum number of days. And the other for the Moderna vaccine, it's uh, four weeks between doses, I think 20. Five is the minimum number of days, but it might be 27. I can't recall exactly what their minimum is, but you want to sort of stretch it out at, I mean, three weeks, four weeks, that's what you're going to get. Um, if you've received the vaccine and experienced side effects that make you ill and unable to work, will you be paid? That I don't have a good answer to. I'm going to leave that to the team members that you have there because I don't know the details of what your HR policies are. How can we be sure that the integrity of the vaccine was kept safe during transport and storage? Yes, this is a good question. Um, the vaccines arrive to us in boxes that are literally covered in dry ice. If that dry ice has melted or if the vaccine um, is in any way not completely solid frozen and there's any openings in that and that dry ice, then we're requested to report that and then that that, that lot will go back. They're packed in boxes, at least the Pfizer's packed in boxes of 975 doses that are completely frozen solid in multiple layers. And even if the outer layer is um, changed, then it is not, does not meet the appropriate requirements. There's a number of, bottom line, there's a lot of quality control measures. You can be confident that they are actually working. Um, if, uh, can someone transmit COVID after being vaccinated? We don't know. I doubt it actually. I think that is highly unlikely, but again, it's the absence of evidence, not the evidence of absence. So what we really wanna see is good study looking at people who've been vaccinated and testing them regularly in order to make sure that they never have COVID. We're gonna be um, doing that just you know, incidentally with our healthcare workers. Some of them are getting tested regularly as part of a different project and a lot of them are getting vaccinated, so we should be able to get that evidence of absence really soon. But right now, there's just no evidence because no one looked in the trials. Again, that is the corner that was cut in order to get things done more quickly and for less, less money, which can then be put into manufacturing and that sort of thing. For those who have received the vaccine, will they still need to be tested on a regular basis? That's a great question. For now, the answer is yes, um, but at some point, that will probably end. How long does it take after having the vaccine before you're protected? So about 50% of people have some immunity, uh, like sort of a, a reasonable amount of immunity after the first dose. What we don't know is how long that immunity is going to last and whether it's even worth it. So there's a lot of talk about delaying the second dose. That is not recommended. The second dose, that boost that you get from the second dose is huge. The, if, if the immune response that you get after the first dose is probably only 10 or 20 percent of what you're going to get after the second dose. And so delaying that second dose or not doing the second dose is a very bad idea. I suspect that the immunity will wane pretty quickly from just one dose of this vaccine. Just like all those vaccines that you've gotten as a child over time, they'll, they'll wane. You really need the boosters. I would strongly recommend the second dose. How long is one protected from COVID after receiving the vaccine? Again, unanswerable question. 
That is a quarter that was cut in order to get the vaccines out quickly. Again, that's not a question that we need answered in order to protect people right away. So it's not, no one required it to be answered. That means that we'll find out. The good news is that the trial participants are still being followed. And at this point, we have three to four months of data suggesting that immunity hasn't waned at all. If I've completed my vaccines, do I still need to wear a mask and social distance? Yes, I strongly recommend it. We don't know whether or not you are going to be able to transmit subclinical COVID to other people. Until we have the answer to that, and until more people are vaccinated, you really want to keep wearing a mask, especially when you're around vulnerable individuals. For example, if I'm vaccinated, um, I still don't want to be unmasked around my mom unless I'm certain, like I've done a quarantine. Um, why is the vaccine needed if I'm doing other things like social distancing, wearing a mask and wearing a shield? Well, it turns out that this new variant from the UK is up to 50 more transmissible. And I don't know how you're going to increase your social distancing, wearing a mask and wearing a shield by 50%. So I think you should add a vaccine to those because you're going to need more protection. This is um, the main vaccines that you have available to you now are both messenger RNA vaccines, which I described earlier. The others will deal with when they come out. Is the Moderna vaccine effective against the new strain of COVID-19? Yes. Um, and yes, the Pfizer vaccine is to be effective um, against the South African strain, which is similar to the UK strain. I think I lost my screen. Oh, I'm back. I'm, I think I'm in and out, in and out. I don't know why. Will both Moderna and Pfizer vaccines be available in years to come? I think they're gonna be thrilled to sell vaccine for many years to come. Are there any other vaccine manufacturers working on making better vaccines? Yes, there are a lot. There's the AstraZeneca, there's the Janssen vaccine that should be approved in February. There's a lot of new vaccines coming out, so sit tight. And then I think there's some other questions here to add. And again, I'm so sorry about the, I, I, I have not had any problems with my uh, connectivity until apparently right today. I'm so sorry about that. Um, uh, what is specifically meant when people are told to consider not getting the vaccine if they have allergies? Um, that That is not a recommendation coming from anyone. Uh, the United Kingdom did tell people that if they carry an EpiPen, they shouldn't get vaccinated, but they are definitely um, walking that back now. Um, how long before we know if immunized folks are not symptomatic spreaders? I think that's probably going to be in the next few months. Um, you lost me again. The next message. Am I back? You're back right now. Yeah. Yes, you're here. Okay, you're back. good. I'm like, oh no, what do I do? Okay, well, I've gone through, I think, all of the uh, penicillin anaphylaxis. Oh, I'll repeat what I said there um, about the penicillin anaphylaxis. If we gave everybody penicillin today, if we gave everybody in the United States penicillin, millions of people would develop, would have anaphylaxis to the penicillin, and no one would hesitate to take penicillin if it was recommended to uh, prevent COVID, except the people who knew they would anaphylax to it. Um, so I think we have to look at the allergy to this vac these vaccines in the context. It's normal for people to have allergic reactions to this vaccine, and the rate which people are getting vaccine are having reactions is very low compared to other medications. Um, yeah, I wish that I knew uh, we have no different number of family members uh, that it's online, so I don't understand why that may be interfering with capacity, but I don't know what to tell you. Um, <laughs> do I give vaccines to persons with current other infection or immunocompromised person? We are offering vaccine to anybody who wants it, including immunocompromised individuals like myself. Um, we're, we are happy to vaccinate people and, and thrilled and, and anxious to vaccinate people with cancer who are getting chemotherapy, things like that, because any protection, even that the only risk for them is that they wouldn't quite get to 95% efficacy. And so we really want to get them to as much efficacy as we can. And so we'll give them their doses. I suspect in the future, we'll find that we should give them another booster, but um, um, for now, two doses, I'll take it and I'll be happy with it. Um, people with other infections. If you think you might have COVID, you shouldn't get the vaccine. Wait and get tested for COVID before you get the vaccine. As long as you're not febrile and ill, it's the same rules as for flu vaccine. Illness, a cold, something like that, but COVID negative, you should go ahead and get the vaccine. But if you have a fever or you're moderately ill or you're so sick that you would probably stay home from work, then you shouldn't get the vaccine that day. Just put it off for a little bit longer. 
And I think that I've gotten through all the questions that have been put to me now, unless there are additional questions that I do not know about. Oh, uh, I read that the Moderna vaccine has more than three times more M mRNA than the Pfizer's. Does that make it more dangerous to the body with stronger reactions? Doesn't appear so. The trial data, you know, the if you look and you compare the actual side effects that people had after each of the vaccines, the Moderna seemed to have slightly more people with nausea, fewer people with fever, more people with uh, fewer people with headache, uh, more people with headache. It's just random. Like I think I think it's just people are getting the same things. There are there is very little to to say that it's any better. It could be that there's decays at a greater rate, and so they need to use more back more mRNA in order to get enough like sort of active mRNA into your arm. So I don't think I would worry too much about that. Um, I've been asked which specific cells are taking up the protein, protein, the local deltoid tissue, and the axillary nodes or a high turnover cells like GI, respiratory, spleen, or bone marrow. It looks like it's all mostly in the local deltoid tissue and axillary nodes. We are seeing a lot of axillary lymph node swelling in people, after, especially after their second dose and in people who've had COVID before. So I suspect it's still there. I don't think it can make it much further than that since it decays within 45 minutes. Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty limited, but I don't know. There's a lot, that's a lot of studying that we'll find out later. Um, from other people looking to see where that that went, although I don't think you'd tell it apart from other things. I think it's largely just a local reaction. That's the, where you get your shot is the epicenter of where your immune response is happening. Okay, I think I have covered everything. Are there any other questions, or did I again? No, you're here. We're we're with you. Okay, good. Dr. Landon, like you to know. Dr. Landon, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, you broke out a little bit when you were talking about the new strains, and there was a lot of questions about the new strains and if the vaccine yes. would, would work. So, yes, if you could expand on I'll that. Again. So, yes, so the new strain in the UK, there's also one in South Africa, they have accumulated like a bunch of different mutations shown in other settings to be associated with super spreader events or to be shown in um, in vitro to make the virus stick better to your cells and get in faster and cause more, like sort of uh, move faster through the cycle of replication, which means you could be contagious even earlier. So this vaccine or these new strains are really tricky. They tend to spread more quickly and they tend to make more people sick than usual. So if you had a room full of 100 people and one person with the old strain of the vaccine, you might get 20 or, you know, depending on what they were doing, you might get 20 or so people sick. With the new strain, it appears as though it's 50% more transmissible, which means that you'd have, if you get, if you would have had 20 people sick before, you'd have 30 people sick. And the only way to combat that is to increase our protective efforts by at least 50%. And I know for myself, I don't think I can mask 50% more. I'm literally wearing a mask all the time, except for around my son. So I don't know how I would do that. I don't know how to keep more distance than just basically being at home the vast majority of the time. So I think that there's a lot. Um, I think that that the vaccine is coming at a time when we really need it is what it comes down to. Now, will the vaccine work? The one mutation that seems to be about evading the immune response or the one that is different than um, the one that changed the spike protein in a way that is different than the antibodies that we naturally make for infection appears to not affect the part. The, the antibodies that are made from the vaccine appear to be more heterogeneous. They attack all the parts of the spike protein, not just the one protected part in the middle that may, uh, may change the confirmation so that existing antibodies can't get into it. So I think everybody is saying that they think the vaccine will be effective. It's possible that on an individual level that it may be you know, 85% effective instead of 95% effective, but I'm, I'm happy with 85%. I'm on a com community or population level, it means we'll have to vaccinate more people in order to get to herd immunity, but um, that, is, uh, that is the most important thing. Um, Additional questions here. Is there a test available to the regular person to tell if the vaccine worked? 
So that that 5% fails, that's not really that you didn't make any immune response at all. It's just that your immune response may not be enough for the exposure that you have. This is another reason why wearing masks, keeping distance is still important. Because vaccines were tested under those circumstances. If you have a massive exposure to influenza after having even an effective immune response to your flu vaccine, you may get so much flu in that you can still get a symptomatic influenza infection, despite the fact that you had some immune response. You'll do better. You won't end up as sick as you would have been beforehand. And the same is true of this. The people who got sick with COVID who failed the vaccine didn't get as sick as the people in the, um, in the placebo arm of the trial. And so it's not that you fail. There's no test that will tell us that because everybody really seems to make antibodies with the exception of seriously immunocompromised individuals. And the fact is that you could overwhelm that with a huge dose of, of virus. And so you really do want to keep up those other protections until the transmission rates are lower and everybody's more vaccinated than they are right now. Um, how long should you wait to clean the area after getting the shot? It doesn't matter. It's inside your arm. You can do whatever you want. You can wipe it off with as much chlorhexidine as you feel like afterwards and you'll be just fine. Are there any other questions? Dr. Landon, this is Tiffany. I was wondering um, if you had any words or kind of some bullet points for any of our physicians or medical personnel that are on the line. Some of them are struggling with talking to our guardians about the vaccine. And I've had some emails about trepidation regarding, well, liability if I tell a guardian, yes, yes, your person should, should get the vaccine. Do you have words of encouragement for our medical personnel yeah. on the line to help them navigate through that? Yeah, there's nothing like personal experience and being, so people, what we're finding when we're talking to people and doing focus groups and working with people about this, they're, they, you can give them all the data in the world about the likelihood of X, Y, or Z, but the one thing they want to know is, but how did you feel when you got the vaccine? So first, vaccinate yourself, be an ambassador, say, I got my vaccine. I um, Just make sure you tell people the difference between having a bad reaction to the shot and having a reaction that just makes you not feel awesome. You know, like I said, when you run or exercise a lot, your muscles are sore afterwards. This is the same thing, but it's working out the immune system. Helping people to understand the, uh, the side effects in that context makes them feel less scared of them. People think that this, these side effects are a bad reaction to the vaccine because the vaccine is somehow toxic or dangerous to the body, and that's why it's making you feel sick. It's nothing like that. It's actually doing, it's a desired effect. Having your arm be sore, having lymph nodes swollen, that is because your immune system is doing what it needs to do to fight off, to learn how to practice fighting off the virus. And so once you sort of explain that that's what it's supposed to do, it is not a toxic vaccine or a dangerous vaccine, and it's not the byproducts or the, you know, any of that stuff. Plus, another thing you can also tell them, there's no preservatives in this vaccine at all. Neither of the vaccines have any preservatives. So if the question is, is it thimerosal free? Yes, it doesn't even have any of the preservatives that other vaccines use to replace thimerosal. Does that help? Dr. Landon, I think we had, yes, I think we had a question from Tiffany, and I don't know if you want to repeat it, Tiffany, around uh, physicians or, um, you know, clinical staff that are trying to work with family members or guardians of, of residents or patients and how to support them to understand the value of vaccination. Oh, yeah. I mean, yes, I, think I think that all the yeah, patients, go ahead. Yeah, all the patients, go ahead. Tiffany, do you want to clarify? Uh, no, go ahead, Dr. Lane. And you, you actually, you cut off where you said there's no um, letting folks know that you got the vaccine yourself oh. is powerful when you're talking with guardians. Yeah. And then yeah. when you came back on, you led into the other things about the different, rea you know, that there's the reaction, the adverse reaction, and just talking yeah. guardians and families through that. Go ahead. Yeah, I think you have to tell them what to expect. I think you have to tell them what to expect. We have a whole what to expect when you get your second dose tip sheet for people. I think you have to be honest and upfront about that. But honestly, the best thing, what people want to hear is not the data about all the other people. They want to know how the people they know, how did you do when you got your vaccine? So be an ambassador and get it first. 
then talk to them about the patient, and then remind them that COVID is deadly. It's a deadly, it's, you're alone, you're not able to breathe, it's a suffering kind of death, and we just don't want that for people. Remember, here's what we need to remember. People, human beings, are very um, predictable in that they anticipate, an, an anticipated loss is estimated by our brains as being much greater magnitude than this same amount of gain. So imagine if I tell you, you might lose $20 by doing this, that seems much worse to you than if I tell you, you might gain $20 by doing this. You will kind of poo poo the gaining $20, but losing $20, you're definitely not going to have anything to do with that. And so when we tell people that there are side effects to the vaccine, it makes them think, well, if I don't get the vaccine, I won't have those side effects. But that's not the right comparison to make. It's the vaccine side effects versus having COVID. And having COVID is awful. And a few people get through it with very few symptoms, but even they can have long-term consequences and other symptoms. And so it's important to remember that we're comparing a few hours of side effects to COVID not to not getting the vaccine. I, the important thing to say is get vaccinated. The va it's vaccine versus COVID, not vaccine versus no vaccine. Your masks, all of the things that you're doing are protecting you, they're great, but we can do better. And you want and need more protection. And this is the way to do it. And we need people who understand and know the science and who, who are able to set aside their concerns uh, that are unfounded. We need people like you to be good ambassadors. And so get your vaccine and then tell everyone about how it went. Did you? Did I